Jim, we left off at the L's on our previous chapter of my quarter quarter box hunt, man. So let's just pick up where we left off from part one, man. Labor Force Blackthorn Publications. At least seven issues of this thing came out. And that check it out. Good. Looks pretty cool, right? Yeah. I have that Zipatone. I used it often in X-Men Grand Design. That's very nice. That's a great first page. I don't know Labor Force. And, you know, I constantly badmouth Blackthorn. Maybe I need to do a reassessment. This looks better than, than most Blackthorn comics. Yeah, still I'm doesn't... confident in that. Still doesn't hold the, that candle to a roach mill, but those that McQueenie guy, he's a bad motherfucker. You know, not bad stuff. No, that looks pretty decent. I'd pick those up for 17 cents. I would always see this ad, but never saw this comic. But it's like uh, Small Soldiers or something. Remember that cartoon? Yeah. Bunch of Bob Powell reprints. Very cool. Lady Crime. I could be a little off, but I think Bob Powell is the answer. Like, you know how in a league of their own, like all of the male baseball players, like were off to war and it was like the women who were, who were, uh, oh, man. Pl playing ball. Like when all, when Kirby and, and, uh, Eisner were fighting Nazis, like somebody had to make comics. And I think Bob Powell was one of those guys. Were there a bunch of women cartoonists there, like circa world war two? There is, this is a dark spot in comics. Like, because who are those guys? That's always been my question. Nobody's been able to give me a good answer. Dan Nadell, get on that shit. But I think Bob Powell was a part of that, you know, and he maybe had uh, one foot longer than the other or like a right. bad vision or so something kept him out of the war. He's one of those standout guys from the from the golden age. When you see reprints, you know, especially like science fiction and horror stuff, it's, uh, what is this, man? This looks great. Yeah, last, the... Last Planet or Lost Planet? Probably an A. David Pugh. I, I seem to recognize his name from, from British comics. I think like later period, 2000 AD. This is a nice looking book. It's so weird. Look at this It's thing. very weird, but it looks, <laughs> it looks impressive, man. He spent some time on this. Yeah. Definite oddball stuff. Libby Ellis. There's a really great Libby Ellis cover out there of her on a bike. This is like the Hernandez brothers have hit. So let's make totally. a, a love in rockets, but like lean way more into the rockets part of it. <laughs> right. I mean, that's totally yes. from like number five cover. Shameless. Yeah, this looks nice. Libby Ellis is a book that people, uh, again, when I was looking for, you know, starting looking for 80s black and white, this is a book that would be pointed out to me. Yeah, I never heard of it before my quarter bin dives. How about these babies, man? Love, Life Brigade, Blue Comet. Blue Comet eventually teams up with John Jacobs and Ken Langriff. So uh, later issues, you'll see some of that. But the lettering of this stuff, this is amazing. You know, uh, Craig Storman is the artist, writer, letterer. This is one of the most impressive of the 80s black and white books to me. Yeah, super rigorous inking with like stipple and, and shit. And it's like pulling from micro knots and... If you look at the lettering close, like, it's these hard right angles. Like, he's going over every letter several times to get these letters. It's like small, it's like small S bubble letters Super obsessed. Yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, but these are good, and, and apparently good enough that they went through several printings of the first issue, and it was enough to launch Blue Comet, which published into the early 90s. That's heck of a back cover right there. That's very West Coast. <laughs> Roller skaters. That's great. <laughs> You can throw that over there. One of my favorite air cell guys, it's not Dale Keown, it's not Guang Yap, it's Jim Somerville. Yes. He did a... Oh, look at this, man. Whoa. Well, you can't fix your feature, man, so this is worth <laughs> extra money. I was going to say. But uh, Jim Somerville, one of uh, my favorite air cell comics he did is this one called Walking Dead. No, not Kirkman and uh, to Tony Moore, but uh, his comic is fucking amazing. Melstrom is the one I always recommend for him. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Walking Dead is only two two issues, man. Um, you could find it, but any Jim Somerville, like, he is up there with the greats of the Outlaw comics as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, this is good stuff. Do you know how many issues, uh, Maelstrom? No, I don't. That's I always think about food. putting together checklists of, like, air cells output for my 86 scene, but I haven't compiled it yet. This is an interesting one. It's like a, it's Indian. 
Mm. Like a lot of the artists you see, man, or it's like Indian names, but it's in English. What's the year? 91. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. I always like to see comics from other places. Um, and I don't have a lot of Indian comics, but I do think there's an Indian comics scene. Uh, this might be my only Indian comic, I, I have to say. Somebody just published an Indian comics anthology that I picked up at SPX last year. It's kind of more on the manga art comic spectrum of side of things. But This is a weird one. And this is like the old trick that people will do at Comic Cons where you could pay uh, you Neil know, Adams to like ink over something for you. And then you could then say that Neil you know, Adams like co inked yeah. the, the, you know, he inked the cover. But some weird. 1978. Yeah. I enjoy this stuff too because it is just talk about alternative comics. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, that's a good looking one. That's a that's the best kind of stuff you pick up for a quarter of books like that. This is a guy who's on my radar that like I didn't know about before, but I really like the stuff, man. Very steeped in the seventies, eighties. Like instead of airbrushing this, like we'll just stipple that, and that's that carries throughout, man. Like I appreciate anybody who's going to sacrifice their wrist to draw their to draw the comic I'm going to read, man. <laughs> yes, or not read. And in, that's, in this case, and that's totally yeah, insane. Yeah, spectacular. Really, really accomplished wow. stuff. I mean, unbelievable. And I never heard of this guy, Brad Foster. I have before. at least one issue of this. This is issue four, so yeah. I, I've never seen this. You never know how far these things go. True. You know, if you have an issue one, who's to say there's even a second? Um, this is impressive, man. It's, it's definitely somebody put some time into it. Beautiful. And of course, to root it in a time period, here are some little uh, turtle robots. And an anim anamorphic guy. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So good, right? That's really impressive. I'm going to have to Google this guy. Yeah, I'd be curious to learn more. This might be the only Dandy Don Simpson comic that I don't have like in, in the entire bibliography. Megaton Man versus Forbidden Frankenstein. But what Don would do is this weird thing of like, this is technically Bizarre Heroes number 16. Hmm. So he's like doing that old school Golden Age trick where they just like change a title like midway. Like, I don't know what the reason for this was. Yeah, I don't know. I always like Megaton Man. I love Such, Megaton Man. So cool looking. I love uh, Bizarre Heroes. Um, his figure work, like he he's a really good figure artist, man. He's good with brush and feathering and stuff too. Like it's very traditional his his approach. Gorgeous lettering, good cartoonist. Yep. And Forbidden Frankenstein, by the way, is a vestige of Anton Dreck, the the Eros uh, comics that that uh, Don Simpson would do under the pen name Anton Dreck. Wow. So it's like uh, it's merging the worlds of of Dreck and Simpson. Nice. Metacops. Monster Comics. Once again, man, Gary and Kim <laughs> would uh, do everything not to fucking publish a superhero comic. <laughs> so it's like, you know, by, by Lincoln Bink. And we don't know if, like, Lincoln Bink, that might be, uh, you know, Jim Wittering or somebody. <laughs> man. It's re really nice art. Yeah. And there are going to be a couple other examples that show up in this part, too, man, where it's like, it's so, like you know, like British 2000 AD stuff. It's so close to superhero, but they just won't go there, man. They just won't put a fucking uh, cape on a dude. <laughs> <laughs> Another Ted McKeever gimmick. Sweet. One issue of Metropole. Like, like, this is a great one with the Mike Mignola backup story. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, my, my McKeever stuff is very spare. Like, I've always appreciated him, but I never gave him that close a look. Look at this stuff. I think this is colored by McKeever, written and colored by McKeever, drawn by Mignola. And that's kind of that early 90s, like a year or two before Hellboy, probably. And this is that part for the course thing where all these guys respected McKeever's gangster man, but it, it, took, it took the readers a little while to catch up. I would get those David Allen Craft uh, comics interview mags and stuff. And these Micra uh, comics were always advertised in there. Um, probably the coolest comics interview comic to seek out is called Psy Cops. It's the first uh, Brian Stelfreeze comics. Um, not much more I could say. Like, I you know, haven't read it. 
Uh, but I've seen these comics advertised a bunch and uh, what they say about advertising impressions, it worked on me. I'm willing to buy it. For... Who's the cover artist here? This looks like um, that 80s cover artist. Uh, I always want to say Patrick Bateman because of Stupid American Psycho and it's not Patrick Bateman. Yeah, but the famous it's, artist uh... got Peter Max or what? No, no not... it's, it's, it's something Bateman, I think. This is the artist. Yeah. Ted Boon... <laughs> Fuck that. I wonder if that's a pseudonym of, of, of him. Cause like those, I, like it's exact. I yeah. have books of him, and that's it. Right. Minds play, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, minds play. Good cover. But you could tell, like you could tell that it's this is what it was going to look like on the inside, man. It's <laughs> it's kind of like pretty disappointing on the inside. But you could tell it's like. There's some like want to be like Ralph Bakshi in there, but like Bakshi like has more structure. That's a good call, yeah. Has more structure to the art, but uh, listen, man, whatever. Never heard of this series. No, I don't know it either. He did quite a few books. I think this is an image book. It is. He did quite a few with them, and I, you know, I, I guess they didn't catch on, or I don't know if anything from this era really made much of an uh, an impression. Yeah, looks great. It's also that size that's a little bit different than a standard comic book. Lucky to find that in a quarter bin. Glenn Dakin, Phil Elliott, Mr. Knight. I have a Glenn Dakin top shelf book that he Yeah, did. I do too, yeah. Contemporary of Eddie Campbell. Good looking stuff. If you uh if you just like showed me like this spread right here, I think I could guess that it was a slave labor comic, but I don't know why. The thick line, I don't know. Looks like a slave labor. Mummy's Curse. Some more Somerville art. This guy's really strong to me. Do we have any idea what he's up to? No, I couldn't tell you. Could I you didn't even black? know like his his credits. You know, like I don't. It feels like somebody that's polished enough. He could have done Marvel DC stuff if he wanted to. I don't know. Mythos Wonder Comics. I think I picked up a mythos. This is this is still some of that stuff where it's like we could make a set. Oh, you got another issue? <laughs> <laughs> They'll be both of ours, man. We'll just keep it in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this stuff's kind of fun. This is interesting. Light on the black areas. Nature of the beast. This is like uh this is like, you could have opened this up, and I could have guessed that it was a Caliber comic. Post-Dark Knight? Totally, man. A lot of this flickety-flick-flick flick with the with the ink. A lot of these, like, unsure ink lines. This is like the staple of, of this era Caliber. Yeah, there were a lot of cartoonists working sort of some version of this, although this looks pretty strong. This is Max Douglas, artist. I don't, I don't recognize him that name yeah um but this feels pretty accomplished richard pace did the cover oh i have another issue Ooh, the lettering amped up this pace character did a backup so let's see how that how that stacks that first stuff reminds me of like ronin a little bit sure this is richard pace yeah richard pace did Doom Patrol? Yeah. Big, or big is that Richard that. Case? Richard Case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we look at too many of these. That Richard Pace backup looked good. Yeah, I agree. Near to Now. All right. Written by Jerry Siegel, Matt Howarth, and somebody by the last name Johnson. Got a little duo tone, but this is like uh, probably the wrong duo tone board for this size of reproduction. A little tight. What are these? Like, look at how strange the proportion of that head is. Like, yeah. it's just like, it's just cut off above the eyes. Gobba gobba we except you're one of us. It's a pinhead. At first I was like, is this Dave Johnson? But it's SMF Johnson. Because the Johnson's almost like, the, the handwriting's almost the same. Very tight lettering. It's like a, it's like a challenge on every front. <laughs> to like, like super small computer lettering, super tight. You're asking a lot to get a person to read this, actually. Yeah. It's very odd. This was a cool thing, though, man. Negative burn number one. Andrew Robinson cover. 
Andrew Robinson's one of the cartoonists that came out of Caliber that I was a big fan of. And he's still active making comics now, but he did Dusty Star at uh, Caliber originally, and that was what, what drew me to his work. Tim Bradtree draws a comic, Bob Burden, Brian Bowen, Phil Hester. That's on this side. And you flip the gimmick. Oh, neat. Issue one. Michael Ringo. Wow. And then, uh, let's see. Uh, they didn't, they, they stacked the deck on the other <laughs> uh, the other side, man. This is the B side. Yeah. Negative Burn is another one of those Calibri anthologies. And it, and I might have been wrong with Caliber Presents. Negative Burn, I think, definitely ran it's into the forties. Yeah, that's that's definitely the big joint. That's good looking stuff, though. There's Bob Burden, Unmistakable. Whoa, a very interesting looking Phil Hester. He's playing around here a little bit. I think Caliber's where I first saw Phil Hester. He used to do the Wretch. This is from a this is a wrestling comic on my list. I forget the name of it, but it's like a weird outer space wrestling. Bone Shaker. Bone Shaker. Yeah, there's a one shot called Bone Shaker. Fantagraphics book. Neil and Buzz in Space and Time. There is a black hole in my history. That looks really nice. Yeah. Of, uh, Fantagraphics published so many of these comics that didn't go on to be eight ball. And you come across them in, in these weird quarter bins. This looks amazing. Like, that's that's beautiful, that ship. Almost looks like Nexus's ship. Yeah, G Gary has taste, man. Like, but like, who is this guy? Where did? What else did he do? That's the that's the thing, man. It's super tight. <laughs> Menagerie is right. Like, there is a, just so much weird stuff here. A couple issues of Nightlife. <laughs> Death or Glory. Strawberry Jam Comics Incorporated. Kind of quickly starts to go down a hill. I think at a flip through, this would be one you'd think was Caliber. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's kind of clever having a photo on page one. I don't see that too often. Everybody who went to the quarter bin sale could could have picked this comic up. Like I, I kept a. Seeing it enough times that at the end I succumbed and just grabbed it, and then I was happy I did because the art is really interesting. Yeah, actually. is that scratch board? At first I thought so, but now I don't actually. Like I think it's it's uh, I don't know I don't know what it is, man. But it looks like pencil line. Maybe some kind of white pencil on paper. Yeah, yeah, because like like a chalk. It's textured. It's not scratched. So right. Yeah, I see that. If any kayfabers know, like uh, let us know. But it's interesting. Yeah, it looks, looks decent. You know? Is that Fanico? I think that's their logo. Yep. Not, not quite Thomas Ott. Right, yeah, Thomas Ott's who you think of. That's a pretty good looking book. Painted covers. Pretty there neat. it is, homeboy. Oh, right. <laughs> Call back. Yeah, man. It's incredible. Yeah. It's 1980s power suits. <laughs> and then, like... A little bit of electro swipe. <laughs> yeah, like real good choice too to like have the little gun flare like off cam that way. Yeah, quite a directional device. Threw the powder in his face, man. <laughs> Kayfabe style, dude. Great Muda. <laughs> I love that cover though. How good is that cover? Totally. The city, the moon behind that character running on a little line. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Ninja bots. It's stop at the title. <laughs> Good looking stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's not bad. Kevin Van Hook. It feels like you should sell a million of these. This I'm, must have been the black and white implosion. I'm sure they did. Like, like this is the same guy. I think, you know, is this uh, Dave Campidi, man? Yeah, it is. And Dave Campidi is, like, notorious for, like, putting out comics called, like, G.I. Rambot, where it's G.I. Joe Transformers and Rambo. Like, give me a fucking break. Look at this Hell yeah. pile of dookie. Buckler did such good covers on these ninja books, man, and, and that's what they would sell them off of. Yeah. Look at this Kama Sutra, <laughs> Kama Sutra techniques, man. <laughs> this is Straight the future up. contents for a meditation hand video for kayfabe. <laughs> oh, get this out of my life. There's a Palookaville comic there's, in there for 17. There's a second issue of this, FYI. That's crazy. I bet. Yeah, I know you got both, right? You're, you're gonna bind those. <laughs> what can you What can you say wrong about the getting a 17 cent Palookaville joint? Fun to look through. You'll get your 17 cents worth out of that. 
Abacus Comics, PandaCon. I had the PandaCon figure that was put out. Like when when Eastman and Laird had that guilt trip and success with Ninja Turtles. There was a Usagi Yojimbo figure, PandaCon figure. Like they were trying to bring their homies along, like the Wu Tang Clan. <laughs> Well-intentioned. Yeah. I quite like the Panda Con uh, figure. He would show up on the series, too. How about this one, Jim? Nice cover. Nice interiors. Yeah, real interesting color. Hector. Very interesting looking color. Never heard of this guy. Obviously a Sienkiewicz fan, right? Yeah. Lots of red. Steeped in red. Dominant color of the palette. Wow. That's neat. And that's a number four, which means uh, presumably three more issues. Pirate Corps Special by the great Evan Dorkin. 1987 on the cover, and I believe, yeah, 1989 on the uh, publication date, man. So that, that goes to show you sometimes like how, how long it takes for a comic to come to fruition sometimes. That's a great find for 17 cents. Early Evan Dorkin, see his evolution. Yeah, they, like I remember seeing this book, like a pirate corps ad in like uh, that Carnage book. It said that was my first, uh, my first uh, discovery of Dorkin's work at all. A lot of black and white uh, checkered ska, the ska <laughs> influence. <laughs> they had this issue of Plastic Forks, yeah. Ted McKeever. Never read it. Like I said, man, it was a great honor to like find a bunch of his stuff in there. Couldn't couldn't pass any of it up after giving it a close look at uh w with you port <laughs> more silver wolf yeah and port is the worst title ever because yeah, to me no port good. is like orifice to me port is like insert at into best, a port at best so it's like he's a superhero hole <laughs> <laughs> yeah that canary yellow isn't helping anyone either that's true prime slime tales a mirage book that i never heard of with very interesting uh, methods and materials put the use on this thing. Lightning doesn't strike twice all the time, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird looking book, man. Check this joint out, man. Probe went through uh, two two different publishers. Of course. Imperial and... Two that we know of. Eternity. Ooh, nice page one. Yeah, this Frank Turner guy shows I like up. like that lettering, too. That title lettering. Yeah, that's very 80s. Yep. John Arcudi introduction. So he's a guy who who has written a lot of comics, like Dark Horse stuff. I think he wrote The Mask. Yeah, I think he created The Mask with uh, Doug Monk or whatever. Yeah, frequent collaborator. That looks good. That interior is much much better uh, looking. Third and time we've seen this back ad. In a different, with a different company every time. I feel like less stellar art on this one. Here's your protector's joint. I think you probably covered all that needed to be said with these guys talking smack in the margins. Yeah. And uh, is there an ad for something other than Reagan's Raiders? Maybe it's maybe it's this thing. No, like like uh, there's a Stallone. Like they were supposed to do a movie with Stall or a movie comic thing with Stallone. Yeah. And it was like how to make movies or something the Stallone way. And so there's ads of that that float through. But as far as I know, the ads all all they ever did smartly these guys came out of the woodwork on facebook and were like hey he reviewed my comic <laughs> this is one of those pretty fun comics like this is super 80s black and white explosion self-published this is what i think of and like that sub text at the bottom yeah it just adds to it like right. it, it makes it a very interesting comic to read Puma Blues, Michael Zuli. I uh, know Michael Zuli's work initially from the trilogy of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle issues that, that he drew. Some of my favorite issues of the Turtles. Absolutely. Man. And this is like his uh, self-published, well, not self-published, but this is his creator-owned kind of kind of hippie comic, man. Environmentalism, uh, Save the Animals, Ra Ra type shit. And uh, you guys, if you're not familiar with black and white comics, you would probably know him as being a principal artist on some of the last uh, trades in the uh, Sandman series. I think his art graces pretty much all of uh, Volume 10, the, the Wake. I've read the first couple of these, and I think this ran 20 issues, 22 issues, something like that. Those couple you flipped through looked amazing. Yeah, and he just, it's its one of those great 80s examples of he just continues to grow and grow and grow. And when you see his work in Sandman, 
it's even far greater. Uh, Makes me want to read this this series though because it's weird. It's sort of sci-fi set in the near future of the eighties. Like yeah, it's uh, it definitely looked good for a flip through there. Raider three thousand, another Gauntlet comic, and a cybernetic eye. <laughs> Look that at that. That looks good. Super cool, right? I'm sold. Yep, I'm on board for this. Like, this guy's going for it. And this, these, to me, this is a gem. Yeah. And and uh, and this is what you hope to find. Wow. When you're digging through. To me, that's a. <laughs> it's I'm almost. Not, I'm not even gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like your damn log, right? Yeah, totally. This is right up my alley. I actually have Raiders three thousand. There might be a couple issues of this, but uh, looks great. This is what you want. This is what I want whenever I pull a quarter book. Especially one called Raider three thousand. So I was pretty astonished by the early Razor comics that were actually drawn by Everett Hartso. And these uh, things looks cool. collect, I guess, the early the early issues, yeah. the Razor archives. And it's my opportunity to take a look at those early things, man. Uh, the art speaks to me. Yes. Uh, I'm sure the reading experience is, is, is silly, uh, especially when he's doing his uh, James O'Barr pastiche. But uh, I thought that could come from Electra Assassin, like trying to, to jump styles. Right. That looks amazing. I, I'm very happy with these. Yeah. It's good to know the archives, too, because um, there's so many Razor comics, and I'm not as it, interested in the later ones. Yeah, you want the Everett Hartso stuff. And, of course, this lady, Heather Elizabeth Parkhurst, a staple of the 1990s Pittsburgh Comic Con, who was your table neighbor. There you go. Memories. Here goes Gary and Kim, man, with like, <laughs> we will not publish superhero comics, but we'll publish something super close. Although this looks badass. That dude screaming was pretty cool. Yeah, it's like a Brian Talbot kind of vibration, man. A ton of panels. That's what I'm saying. Like, Fanographics published a lot of these pamphlet comics. Yeah. They're almost all worth a pickup, man. If you find them in these discount bins, why not? Red Fox, not to be confused with the comedian. Is that hairier? Mm. No, Valkyrie Press. That looks cool, man. I like I like the look of this. Yeah, it has the same energy as like a hairier comic. Red Fox is a co is a series that I've heard of, and I think I even have some, but it's not this one. So I wonder if this is a different volume or something. We talk about these books switching publishers like it is kind of hard to keep track of of these titles that you hear about and then there are three books that match that title right. that looks good yeah yeah you're gonna see uh verbal diarrhea look wow. at that jeez <laughs> that's where you need tom Warzakowski. <laughs> wow they're they're asking a lot of you to like it better be the most amazing is this Pros. the same writer artist? It, it must be, right? Like, I feel like there's a personality type on display here. I don't think so. Oh, geez. Wow. That looks neat, though. Good art. The Renegade goes through two different publishers here. First issue, Ripoff Press. Second issue is uh, probably self-published. Todd McFarlane intro. Yes. I have a collection of this stuff. There was a newspaper strip at some point as well. I think this guy might be out of Ohio. Um, There's almost like a shaky cane to it in its early. Yeah. But I'm sh I can promise you this guy does not know who shaky cane right. even is. Yeah, I forget the connection to McFarlane, but it's in that collection that I have. He probably sent McFarlane some work. Yeah. Maybe had a pinup published in there or something. Yeah. It's maybe, pretty neat looking. Maybe the guy drew yeah. one of the, the uh, just looking for the name. Because... You, that looks pretty good. Yeah, he would hire, uh, McFarlane would hire, like, noobs to draw the toy comics that would be uh. packaged. So, that, the Renegade isn't to be confused with the Renegades. <laughs> <laughs> Hall of Heroes joint. Wow. That's pretty strong. Very gray. Yeah, it looks like maybe markers or something creating that wash. <laughs> These are... Look crazy. <laughs> Look at how wild that cover is. I know, and like like they sort of like lean on those yeah. bright colors. Oh bullshit. For sure. Ryan number two. Hell yeah. This comes out of Ohio, 86. 
they're two issues as far as I know, and they're half an inch taller than your average comic book, yeah. which makes them easy to spot in a back issue bin, usually in far from mint condition because that top's just had the shit kicked out of it. Exactly. Early manga anime influence, clearly. I was surprised when I, when I picked this up, I had seen it before, and I thought it might have been early manga imports, but it's not. It's yeah. just a couple of Ohio dudes that... that you know, we're drawing those influences. And yeah, it's very Tezuka. Yeah. Early Tezuka look. Two Roach Mill number there he ones. Is. And just like, let's take a look, man. Like, yeah, this stuff's good. Like, yeah. look at that. This guy was uh, at the Kubert School. And it's written by Rich Hedden. Uh, and he, it's Tom McQueenie on art. Both of these guys, I think it was a trilogy of uh ninja turtles issues in like the late teens early 20s somewhere around there something uh something about new york city like unmistakable if you see the art um but just great cartoonist man i th this guy would do um wow some things with alan moore on the tomorrow tales later i think he would he would ink hillary barda maybe did he end up at wild storm tom Mc... mm, i'm not sure i I'm feel like sure. he might have been on like um Stormwatch, like late late nineties, early two thousand Stormwatch yeah, era or something. But Rochemill was one of the early black and whites that I came across when I was a kid, and it was like, man, this stuff does look crazy. Yeah, Roran Ricks, Rare Bit Fiends, man. Some of uh, Rick Veach's Dream Comics. Whenever self published nineties, self published. Whenever I see these things, I'll, I'll scoop them up. Yeah, good cartoonist, great page layouts and stuff. And this was like his passion project. Yeah, check out these, man. Independent uh, production values, man. The Rock Mees. Color as well. Yeah, yeah. I've seen these, and I, I cannot make heads or tails. I have no idea what is going on, what's behind them. They got endorsement deals, though. Yeah, it makes me wonder, like, was... I, I Like I said, I can't figure it out. <laughs> Rock and Roll High School. You got the, uh, you got the Ron English comic. And uh, this one has Frank Kozik artwork in there. When would this have been published? Looks like but super there's early. There's your Cage T three thousand, the Roger Corman book. Ninety five. Yeah. Wow. Is this a part of that group, the the Corman comics? It is because Rock and Roll High School was the Ramones movie. Yeah. Shouts to the homeboy, Toby Sweet. Cypress, Rod Racer. This is my first Toby Cypress exposure. Yeah, me too. I I, uh, I got the uh, self-published joint yep. at um, at uh, Heroes Con. This is the image version. Yeah. This was a cool one. I like his artwork a lot. Yeah, a lot. I also like race comics, so it's pre pretty good. Not that many car racing comics out there. Ronnie Rat. I don't know anything about this, but I like it. Yeah. Had you heard of this before? Not at all, man. It just looked weird. It is super weird looking. And uh, the print is off, like Margaret Thatcher. It's like it's like it's all in there, man. This is the comic that I was talking about, where it's like Tim Vigil yeah. does breakdowns for uh, S Steve uh, Hughes, the the future Lady Death artist. Yeah, I have a couple of these. I didn't realize that Stephen Hughes, Stephen Hughes was part of this, but uh, yeah, Tim uh, Vigil breakdowns. Yeah. Oh, this is this is um, Blue Comet. So this is the um, Life Life Brigade publisher. Yeah, great stuff. Yeah, that's good looking. Sam and Max. I'm a big mark for Steve Purcell's work. I have I have this in many uh, permutations, <laughs> and trades and stuff, but I don't have this exact thing. Why not scoop it up? Sure. 17 cents. You'd regret it if you didn't bring it home. <laughs> Some more Gauntlet comics. Samurai 7. <laughs> uh, I love ninja comics. Yeah, not to be confused with the great Kurosawa movie. <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to be confused. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Satan 6, your boy John Cleary. <laughs> I won't complain about that. Look wow, that. Jason Voorhees. I didn't know he was in this. In a Jack Kirby comic. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. I'll grab scuds that are super cheap, man. I, I've given it tr tries before, and I actually didn't like it that much. But people tell me that it's like later ones are like the good ones. He is part of Heat Vision and Jack. He is, And yeah. so, like, that's all I need. So I'll keep picking those up for a quarter. 
This is another cool one, man. This, see, I'm gonna make the whole exercise is to get you to rethink a blackthorn. I'm you're you've done it. I I feel ignorant for all of my blackthorn criticism over like, the years. Look at this shit. Yeah, I do like this. It's pretty cool, man. If I if I was at SPX and somebody had this on their table, I would buy it. And we'd be singing their praises on the Kayfabe <laughs> Network. <laughs> Brendan McCarthy. Oh man, this is the issue. Good find. Yeah. He only drew one issue of this, as far as I know. He would do covers, right? And I. I don't know about that, but I do know that they would sometimes get like the gang, the Deadline Gang, and he would participate in that. And those two, Shaky Kane, would show up and stuff. Yeah. Brennan McCarthy, man, that's that's a good good find. Is this Illuminatus? Yeah, Illuminations, Illuminatus, yeah. Oh man, this is conspiracy stuff. Yeah, man. There's probably some really good information in this comic. Well, I'm saying like we are part of the Illuminati. <laughs> See, subliminal yeah, yeah. shit, man, there's shit written up in them clouds. <laughs> subliminal full page splash. <laughs> <laughs> Shock therapy, hair, more hairier comics. I Anthology. like their uh, logo a lot. Anthology. That looks uh, good. It, it it it's all spotty, man. It's it's gonna change as the issues go. I love the color sets. You know, there's something there. There's a vision. Yeah, the horror anthology. Such a long history in comics of that. It feels like regularly people are reinventing that. I think this completes my Reggie Byers original run Sweet. of Shuriken. That's what everybody should tell me to bind. Yeah. Ninja Comics. America uh, Manga. Yep, it's all there. And I think Reggie Byers self-published this first yeah. volume. I think he came out of Robotech, like the, the early Robotech. The Kamiko shits? I think so. I'm pretty sure that's his background. 1986. This is good stuff. It has that vibe. Check this out, man. Siege of the Alamo. Fucking outlaw comics dude with Davy Crockett. Wow. It looks like they're really trying to... Yeah, I've never seen this. Yeah. I would love for Davy Crockett to pull out a fucking Uzi, though. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some more of your homeboy, Cleary. Yes. Sinja. I'll always grab Sinja, although I think there's only a couple of them, unfortunately. We talked I about this in, in, uh, in Wizard Eps. Yep. Several issues of Slash. That's a good That's a good pull. A lot of uh, James O'Barr in here. And, uh, you know, this is North Star, so it's a lot of, like, the Tim Vigil light yeah. Kind of characters who still are really good. Look at that vigil shit. Yeah. <laughs> Reminding everybody how it's done. <laughs> Soul Wind. Our boy uh, Scott Morse. Yes. When he was still called C.S. Morse. Doing some of, uh, like, this is 1997. Like, as far as I know, he's like one of the f early people who wasn't like one of the um, founding fathers who did like indie looking image comics, you know, I'm not talking like Mike Grell fucking shaman's tears, but like this kind of shit. He's like the OG. He's always been an innovative uh, graphic artist. Working at Pixar now. Yes. Come back to comics, Chris. We love you, man. I mean, Scott, <laughs> excuse me. Oh yeah, dude. Space 342434. Was this on your gimmick, man? I did. I did get this and there's so much to call out. It's the same as the wrestling comic. Yes. And uh, they misspelled the in the end. Yes. Um, it's just all around, man. I don't know what else the Nova Girls did except for this and Kissing Canvas, but I celebrate their whole catalog, at least what I know of it. Here, here's a funny one. A comic called Spam. <laughs> and you Saurus. laugh, right? <laughs> you laugh, but this shit is money, man. Looks like a whole mess on the damn screen. <laughs> I don't know, Ed. You're going to need to read this one and get back to me. Yeah, maybe. I think I might have oversold it. <laughs> <laughs> Another North Star. Splatter. Not the greatest. I wonder if they did well and then it was like rushed to try to get content out. And it's it's all wanna be everywhere. So I just saw like, like wanna be Charles this, this Burns. Stuff looks, yeah, that's that's what I was gonna say. Like this stuff looks kind of neat. Yeah. I like it better than the lead story if those are two stories. Yeah. Star Reach Four, Howard Chaykin, early gimmick. A lot of good artists show up in here. You'll see, you'll see Dick Giordano and people like that. Yeah, that's neat. Early uh, Chaykin in black and white. This is interesting. 
spiral path like it's like does this come from some kind of weird like weekly strip like a sunday strip or something there's something this is there for a reason you know totally because british. because the original you think it's british i don't know that's my guess yeah looks good it does look good yeah whoever's drawing that knows what he's doing steve parkhouse steve parkhouse i had a um like a how to draw comics book by him that was really good and I think he's done some stuff with Alan Moore. Stark Future. Yes. This ran for a long ways. This is an air cell book. It is. 86, man. It's amazing, these these titles that run like a dozen issues or 18 issues and sci-fi epic, I suppose. I picked up a couple of later issues of that. Dig. Straight oh, toasters. Oh, wow. Straight toasters in a quarter box. That's a good find. Yeah. Have you read this before? Never. Never. Looking forward to giving this one a shot. The guy who drew this, Tex Benson, is probably like one of one of uh, my favorite artists that I've discovered in this in this hall. Um, Chuck uh, Chuck Roblin, nineteen eighty five. Man, like, look at this shit, dude. Pulling from EC Comics, Wally Wood, kind of like a Mark Schultz light. Kind of like if your damn log guy used a brush. Yeah, this stuff looks really good. I, I, I'm a little embarrassed. Metro is a publisher that I, I have some comics that they've done, although I can't name any off the top of my head. I think they're a decent publisher. Um, this stuff looks amazing, though. Wonder, Do you know if he did anything else? I don't. I, he's a name to Google because, I mean, this is the most accomplished stuff of most of this. Yeah, that's legit. Oh, I wonder if they did Matt Champion. This is a wrestling comic that only ran one issue, unfortunately, and it, because it was good, but it's like set in the Depression era wrestling stories. And Joe Casey and I have both talked about this, like, are there more issues? Have you ever seen another issue? And I believe only one was published. Thieves, Silver Wolf. Every, every time you go quarter bin diving, you will find a Silver Wolf comic that you never knew existed. <laughs> I can't believe exists. <laughs> Oh, wow. Rack, before uh, Shock on the Forever Man, <laughs> Thunder Mace number one. <laughs> Look at that, Rack Graphics, man. He's been using that logo, man, for Robert 30 years. Krause. There, there he is. Shock on the Forever Man. Maybe it's his first appearance. Maybe this is worth a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> you guys should have saw the way Jim just looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> How about this one, man? Adam McDaniel's Tool. That looks very good. Yeah, very, like, uh, there's... There's a Bernie Wrights in, in here. Is Adam McDaniel the one that Neil Adams was talking about in that Wizard interview? I don't recall. Well, I, I, I know, that might have been Walter you're, McDaniel. You're right. It was Walter. This looks awesome, though. Crazy cover. Trickster Monkey King. Another one of those uh, Eastern mm -hmm. comics, man. Love it. Yeah. Like, this cover was... This is probably, like, one of their most famous covers, because I remember seeing this image a lot. That's such a good splash page. Yeah. That looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I, this one's high on the to-read list. Vic Blood, Harlan Ellison, Richard Corbin. What could go wrong, man? This is a beautiful comic. Two issues published by Mad Dog. I think that's who did Eddie Current. Mm. You know, you start to try to you start to see these publisher names popping up again and again. But really beautiful comic. Richard Corbin, black and white on newsprint. Pretty nice. Yeah, and you ain't getting that in, in, until uh, you, you dig you dig super deep in like the '60s, man. Vortex Hall of Heroes, one of these McFarlane clones. <laughs> yeah, they published several of these guys that, that were, obviously McFarlane was their biggest influence. I kind of like seeing that. Yeah, there's that Trent Kanuga dude who did, uh, what the heck did he do? Creed. Creed. <laughs> this is a fine dad. Yeah. This is a really good score. Once again, like, I have so many of these, but I don't know which ones I have. So I just grab them all, and then I'll... I'll sh Look at these covers, man. So iconic. Does Somerville do some of these? No, it's always that Dennis Bouvet or whatever. Yeah, d the Dennis Bouvet look awesome. Yeah, man. That's cash money. He does, like, the first 15 or so, and then I'm not sure who takes over after that. Well, we have post-15, so let's see what so we have So it could here. be Somerville. could be a, a Del Keown. Good looking Del Keown. Del Keown Sword and Sorcery. Ah, Somerville did this cover at least. Inked by Somerville, Barry Blair. Yeah. 
Warlock 5, man, that original run is, is one of my favorites of these black and white 80s. Lot, there are a lot of these floating around in there, and I'm not familiar. I don't know what this is. Yeah, IDW. You know, like, so many books come out now, it's hard to keep track of it. It's funny. We're almost in another black and white explosion era where it's like, look at this book. Can yeah. you pull it out of a quarter bin? <laughs> right. Amazing. If you showed somebody in 1986 these colors, they would just go, they, they wouldn't believe what they were seeing. They'd think you dosed them with something. Jim. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yes. I had to. Because this is this is Zen One, and talk about value. Yeah, right. I had to see what the OG looked like. <laughs> Look at this thing, man. This is wild looking mm. shit. Wow, it's insane. Do you have more respect now for this uh, the writer that sold this? Yeah, not at all. Because <laughs> man, he he could sell air conditioners to to a, Inuit. Yeah, good call. Yeah, this is a big pile of hokum. And then this one has that Bill Mouse work right. signed by the great uh, man himself. And like when I kicked it open, I saw this. I'm like, fuck, well, I'm going to have to check this out, man. Yeah, it looks tough. I still think that the writer dude's a corny fuck. Uh, but uh, shit. Looked good. Yeah. You know? Hey, I think I might have defended Zen whenever... Uh... You went the other way. <laughs> yeah, mine is just on people trying to rape and pillage my, my <laughs> beloved medium. <laughs> Zombie War. I actually pulled this from the Ajama Corns box, so this is a double. Oh, this is this in color. This is an IDW reprint. Oh, this is in color. Never mind. I won't get rid of this. Yeah. Looks pretty good in color. Yeah. Some of their color stuff I have not been a fan of, but that that's not bad. This is another artist that I think is really exceptional that I, agree. I that I found. Like, do you know that this? Do you know the? Comic? I know Zone Continuum. Bruce Zick. Like, look at that shit, man. Yeah, that's <sighs> that's awesome. Yeah. And this is a thing, man. Like any of these comics that we showed off in in th these stacks, far surpasses and is way more interesting than any Jobber comic uh, of, of the big two out in the past twenty years, man. Like they sent they sent me running in this direction man i love these comics so i look forward to more of this kind of uh digging around these cells come come by now and we'll close this out with the great uh Lo roger langridge yeah he's a fantastic cartoonist one of the few guys i've bought original art from and have on my wall and love looking at yeah that, that one clown comic like like i remember seeing that stuff and just like the obsession and how perfect yes. everything looked. Very man. precise. Great lettering. You know, this is a he's a cartoonist, you know, he does all this stuff and, and the end result very entertaining. Oh, Jim, I'm bushed, man. I don't think I need to buy another comic for at least a week. We have quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna be busy reading for a while. It's true, man. And the hope is to unpack and discover small hints of genius that I could steal from my own work uh, amongst this stack of stuff, man. So it shook out to something like two, 352 comics, ends up being about 17 cents per. That's good value. Hard to argue with that. Let's get the fuck out of here, man. Yes. K Fabers, if you haven't done so already, like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon, it'll notify you whenever we have new videos available. You can pick up Cartoonist K Fabe merch at our spread shop. There's a link below this video. We're gonna go read some of these messes. But you guys know what your marching orders are. Read more comics.